Right. So the gentlemen, when we talk of contemporary issues, if you look at your syllabus, what do they need us to discuss under contemporary issues? Remember contemporary issues, we are looking at uh, the current trends in finance, regionally, and of course, internationally, current trends in finance. Like right now, everybody's talking about what year, the euro bond, euro bond, all right? You know, that's a current issue. I mean, initially, governments used to borrow internally using treasury bills, using uh, treasury bonds, all right? But now in this case, international markets are opening up, all right? And there are those people who are feeling like, I mean, why should we be borrowing through the euro bond and yet these particular Europeans who are, and of course the USA who are giving us this money are not so strict with their loans. They're not even following up. We ask for 1.5, for example, in this case here, million US dollars. We are given like that. And there is nobody from outside there who wants to really for, and they know for sure that this money is not coming to help most of these countries. They know, for instance, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, that um, this money is being squandered by individuals. It was not the whole of it, but most of it. But they're not following. So there is this group uh, of thought this other uh, group here, which talks about, I mean, why don't you go and borrow from these Islamic states using what we call the Sukuk bonds? Yeah, the Sukuk bonds, using what we call the Sukuk bonds. Sukukama Sukuk, Sukuk bonds. You see, with Sukuk bonds, ladies and gentlemen, these are Islamic bonds. A country that issues these Sukuk bonds will be able to get money from Islam, members of Islam. And the members of Islam, whenever they give you money, they are very specific. They follow to the latter, wanting to know where their money will be invested. Normally, their loans are for infrastructure, they're infrastructural, and they would want to know, I mean, if I'm giving you a million US dollars, where are you going to invest my money? All right. I remember when uh, Rotich was the Minister of Finance, he floated this idea of Sukuk bonds and people never wanted to hear about it because they knew for Sukuk bonds, the Islamic countries that are going to give us money, they would want to know where the money will be invested. All right. So Sukuk bonds is one of those things that we must discuss under contemporary issues. Ladies and gentlemen, under contemporary issues, we have this thing of what here, cryptocurrency. We are required, if you look at your syllabus, I'm just trying to give you an overview of uh, what we, we, we are expected to discuss. We have here cryptocurrency, all right? This digital virtual coins, all right? Like right now, you can see the Bitcoin's value has really, really increased. I mean, the other day when Bitcoin was introduced, all right, not the other day, but quite some time, it has been in the market for long, maybe more than 10 years. I mean, this thing was uh, coming outside here in a very, very big way. I remember there are even hotels that had marked themselves that uh, when you come here, you can only eat and uh, pay us using what are these Bitcoins. But all of a sudden, in this case here, we are seeing a situation where Bitcoins are no longer being trusted. I'm so sure even here, there must be somebody who came into the Bitcoins market. They did the Bitcoins business, say, for a year, but they dropped out. What do you think in this case here are the challenges, ladies and gentlemen, affecting this Bitcoin's market, crypto generally, Ethereum. What do you think are the major challenges? Where are people dropping out of these investments? Where are people shying out of uh, this crypto? Is there somebody who knows who can just give me one point? Remember, I'm just giving you an overview before I start. Supply and demand, Paul How? Are you, are you, do you mean that uh, there's no supply? There's no demand? Please try. It's a good point. I can see it, but try to elaborate. High volatility, yes. High volatility. High volatility. You can buy this thing today at uh, like, uh, at, at, I mean, uh, a Bitcoin. One Bitcoin, I remember some time back, was going for $6 million. You buy it today for $6 million, and then tomorrow you hear that uh, it is going for just a million. You lose your $5 million right away. Lack of regulations. Right, right. These bitcoins, I mean, there is no government that is regulating it. So that automatically, in this case, it takes us to what Edward Miner is selling us. There is a lot of cybercrime going on with this. And that is why you get somebody comes 
this person comes, I mean, that's a very good, good website of these Bitcoins and uh, other cryptocurrencies. They say that they are miners, that they're doing mining of these coins. And then they get so many people coming on board. So many people coming on board. And remember, they are very, very bright. These guys here use uh, these uh, 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 kind of marketing where they tell you, go and bring in your friends to come and invest. Right, so you're brought in like 10 family members, and then from nowhere, one day when you wake up one of these mornings, you realize that that website is no longer up. You try in this case, you're your best, and then everybody now in this case here will be coming up after your neck, saying that you have conned them, and yet you are really trying to, I mean, help them to invest. So, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, because of lack of regulations. Then we have in this case here high possibility of being what here, being conned. Great, 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 great. So we have in this case here very good points here. No government regulations, high volatility, politics. Sustainability of Bitcoin, it requires a high computing power and the cost of power is very high. <laughs> Dennis, you brought in a very, very good point here. I mean... Producing these Bitcoins is not a simple thing. The other day, I got a classmate of mine. And you know, I did my high school long time ago, 1997. This guy told me that he is mining Bitcoins. You see, I've done a lot of research on Bitcoins. I know to wake up, I mean, there are very few computers in Kenya here which have the capacity of mining even a fraction of a Bitcoin. Very few. Even the kind of uh, power that you need to be able to mine a Bitcoin, I mean, it's not really, I mean, it's very, it will be very expensive for you. So and this is why, of course, like, you know, those kind of people in this case who are in this kind of business, I see, yeah, I mean, it, it's very, very hard. It's very, very hard for you to become rich. And that is why most of these guys here end up doing the wash wash kind of a thing. All right. So in this case here, these Bitcoins, these cryptocurrencies, ladies and gentlemen, they are good. And I'm so sure in the next 10 years, they're going to become, in this case, I mean, a big thing. All right. But getting somebody who is doing this business legitimately is not easy. Is not easy. I know of so many people who have invested in these cryptocurrencies who came out with nothing. People have put in like even 10 million. All right. Right now, when you get them, some of them in this case outside there, they are walking, talking uh, or, or by themselves. All right. Because they can't believe you know, you know, normally the promise is so high. People promise you heavens. And yet in this case, they bring you hell. All right. So there are challenges really there. There are challenges really there. All right. I can see very good. Uh, yeah. I can see very good points there. Yes. It's a very fertile ground for money laundering. Money laundering, money laundering, yes. So people fear it. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the other thing that the exam examiner wants us to discuss about is what we call crowdfunding. Crowdfunding. You can see in the syllabus, they are calling it cloud. C-L-O-U-D, cloud. Cloud. It's supposed to be crowdfunding. I'll be able to raise this thing with Kasneb. I don't know who did that. It's supposed to be called crowdfunding. Because under crowdfunding, ladies and gentlemen, you as a, a person who has got an idea, you will be able to pitch your concepts online, asking in this case here, these online participants to invest in your company. So under crowdfunding, normally in this case here, this particular businessman will go to a crowd, many people where each one of them is contributing something small, small, small. Like right now, there is a program I normally see on Citizen TV where the church is asking people to be just contributing 1.5 shillings per day. 1.5 shillings per day, all right? So yourself, of course, in this case, as you look at it, you'll see it's something that really doesn't even make sense. This small, little money, I mean, I mean, you'll not even feel it. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, when we pull these resources together, they'll be able to create a very big fund, a very big fund in this case here that uh, will be able to, like now, alleviate whatever poverty, right? But we'll be able to take some of these kids here to school, to school. Now, is there anybody, ladies and gentlemen, here, 
greater gi i can see your question there is there anybody who has ever raised who has ever raised money from any crowdfunding platform and if yes which platform did you use? Because they are not very many. They are normally known. Anybody who has ever used any crowdfunding platform to raise money, to raise money, I don't know how Crowd1 works. I don't know how Crowd1 works, Maurice. I don't know how Crowd1 works. Of course, there is this general online one. For example, somebody can use WhatsApp in this case here to fundraise. Like M Changa for charity initiatives, yes. M Changa is very, very popular. M Changa. M Changa is very, very popular. I'm waiting because I know there must be a ninja here that has ever used. Does it mean that you guys don't have, you know, for you to have gone for these platforms, you must be having crazy business ideas, but you lack funds. You lack funds. Chumzi, I've never seen. Chumzi, no, Chumzi, Chumzi. Chumzi, Chumzi is a money market fund. But Maurice, then you have not understood this concept of crowdfunding. I'll be able to explain I'll be able to explain this better. You know, crowdfunding, you come and tell in this case here the whole world. Uh, I have an idea of making RCM Online College a virtual university that will be able to serve the entire world. How much do I need? I need like 20 billion US dollars to be able to do that, to put down the infrastructure. And then, of course, I'll bring in people now to come. Number one, they assist me either by donating, by donating, they donate. They donate. Or number two, in this case here, they come and, uh, I mean, buy shares. Buy shares. Spot Pesa is not a crowdfunding tool. Because Spot Pesa, like, will you be able to raise money really through Spot Pesa yourself as an individual? And are you raising it from many? Remember the crowdfunding, you are getting money from many, many, many people who are spread across. Who are spread across. That's crowdfunding. Crowdfunding. So you're raising money online. You must be having a business idea. I even believe that people who go to Spot Pesa don't have any business ideas. You must be having a legitimate business idea. I'll be able to share this. Now, as a gentleman, the other thing in this case here, they want us to discuss with you under, under this uh, topic here, under this topic here, under this topic here is what we call Islamic finance. Islamic finance. We're going to see Islamic Islam, in this case here, like go fund me. Thank you very much, Esther. Ah, now I'm even forced in this case here to come and show you. Go fund me is a very, very popular. So they want us to discuss about Islamic finance and then they want us to discuss about big data, big data, big data. Now, if you allow me, then I'll be able to share my handout that I've been able to share with you there pretty fast. Pretty fast. Let me increase the font size. All right. So then here we are. So contemporary issues in finance. I'll read very fast because now you have the handout. And my intention is to finish this. And then I start real estate topic today. These are eight pay. That, no, they're not eight. They're 18. Uh, 18. But we'll be able to push through them. Now, contemporary issues in finance, cryptocurrency, digital or virtual currencies that use cryptography for security. Now, is there anybody who has ever heard of this cryptography? Cryptography. Cryptography, ladies and gentlemen, normally cryptography technique brings a lot of what is secrecy in communications. Assuming, for example, today, there is a lady in this case here assuming, I'm just assuming because I can never do that. I don't even have time for that. Assuming in this case here, I wanted to marry a second wife. And uh, in this case here, I look for a lady here called Mary. Because they don't, we don't have Mary. Mary is my mother. All right. And then now Mualimu does a very good message to this lady here. In this case here, I'm asking uh, in this case here to marry her. So from my phone to her phone. 
Is it possible for you as a third party to intercept the message I've written to this lady in between here? Don't, don't steal my phone. Don't in this case here steal Mary's phone. Can you in this case here interject this message here, intercept it and be able to read it? And be able to read it? No. In between, not unless in this case here you read it from the lady's phone or from my phone. In between here, it doesn't matter what you're going to do. You can't in this case here access that communication. If you get somebody telling you that I'm monitoring your messages from Safaricom, that person is cheating you. Because normally these messages are end-to-end -end in encrypted. It's that encryption that you are calling cryptography. Where, in this case here, this message, this me when this message is moving from my phone to Mary's phone, in between here, they use a very different language, language that cannot be understood. This message only makes sense when it is in my phone and when it is in Mary's phone. That's what we call cryptography. So in this case, ladies and gentlemen, the Bitcoins also use this cryptography through their blockchain through the blockchain. So when I'm sending you a crypto, a crypto, a cryptocurrency, I'm sending you this virtual digital coin, I'm making this payment, somebody cannot intercept. Somebody cannot intercept. Just like M-Pesa, not unless in this case here you give out your own password, ETC. Somebody cannot intercept an M-Pesa message you're sending to somebody. So M-Pesa also makes use of what here, this crypto, although it's not really... I mean, crypto 100%, because at some point, you'll be required here to do what you have to convert this. It does not become purely crypto. But you see, the other day I saw Central Bank trying to come in this into this thing of a cryptocurrency. So perhaps when they come into cryptocurrency, they develop this virtual currency, they're going to um, enable and personal become 100% what year? 100% uh, crypto. 100% crypto. It's encrypted. I'm surprised you guys know this language and it's encrypted. Yes, it's encrypted. Not possible. All right. So examples, we have the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple. Remember, Bitcoin is the most popular one. All the others, we call them the alt coins, alternative coins, alternative coins. Now, they, of course, have uh, high volatility. In this case here, that's why they, they're not uh, really liked by many people. They have potential for high returns. And of course, we have what we call regulatory challenges. Cryptocurrency is a type of digital or virtual currency that uses cryptography for security. It operates on a decentralized network, typically based on blockchain what year technology. When we talk of decentralization, cryptocurrencies operate on decentralized networks of computers often using blockchain technology. This decentralization eliminates the need for a central authority, such as government or financial institution making transactions peer-to-peer. -peer. When I'm sending you a digital currency, I don't need any approval. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh -huh. It is you and myself here. Blockchain technology is a distributed ledger that records all transactions across a network of computers. It records all transactions across a network of computers. Each block in the chain contains a list of transactions, and once a block is completed, it is linked to the previous one, forming a chain of what here? A chain of blocks. Blockchain ensures transparency, security, and the immutability of transactions. Immutability means water that you cannot change. Ladies and gentlemen, there are countries that have been able to use blockchain to solve their day-to-day -day problems, like Sweden. Most of these European countries, specifically Sweden, had issues to do with land. I mean, they had lots of fraud on their land registry. And then they decided to go blockchain way. And they were able to eliminate anything to do with fraud from their land registry. In Kenya, we anticipated to have this blockchain technology to help us, in this case, here, manage our land transactions. That is where we have, for example, the Arthisasa. But Artisasa is a joke of a system. It's not a system based on blockchain. Because how does this blockchain work? Assuming in this case here we are living in like which area now? Talk of, for example, Machakos. 
So if we have in this case here Machakos, for example, we have a DB of all the landowners in Machakos. All right. We are going to have also another DB of all the landowners, for example, in Nairobi. All right. So a DB is a database. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, in this database, when they are connected through blockchain technology, all right, peer-to-peer -peer again, all right, we have a database, but we are connected here. So Joshua Aura can go into this blockchain and get to view who are the owners of land in Machakos. If, for example, you would want to sell your land from Machakos, you only need to go to the blockchain and say, hey, this land is on sale. And once you say this land is on sale, everybody will be able to see. Before you make any transfers of your land, you're selling your land. In this case here, for example, Alex Ogega is selling his land to Joshua Aura. Well, in this case here, you uh, send the, uh, the communication to Joshua Aura. Then you'll be able to get, in this case here, messages on your phone asking for your authorization. Blockchain is very, very secure, and it is this technology that the Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies are riding on. That is why they are very secure. Even this fraud that you normally see happening on this um, cryptocurrency, it's because of people who take advantage of lack of regulations to come up with their own platforms. Otherwise, if you get a genuine Bitcoin, it will be very hard in this case here to steal in the Bitcoins yeah, because everybody in this block, you know, they, they're, they're chain, the computers in this case here are speaking to each other. Everybody knows who is doing what. Everybody is able to see the portfolio of Aura here. All right. So one day in this case here, when Aura is selling something, everybody in the marketplace knows. All right. So of course, in Kenya, we can't implement that because of the kind of thieves that we put up there to manage our operations. They would not want, in this case here, quite a transparent system like that. So ladies and gentlemen, then we have in this case here, Bitcoins. I don't want uh, to go through this like uh, it was created in 09 by anonymous person or group using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. This one here you'll be able to read on your own. Bitcoin is the first and most well-known cryptocurrency often referred to as the digital gold. It operates on a proof of work consensus algorithm where miners solve complex mathematical problems to validate transactions and add them to the blockchain. So next time when you get somebody telling you that they are mining Bitcoins, ask them whether they are very good in mathematics. All right. There's a lot of, uh, in this case here, programming that happens. That is why these computers would want a lot of electricity. It's not your normal computer that will be able to mine any Bitcoin. So if you get in this case, here, somebody cheating you that they are mining Bitcoins, please respect them. Respect them. So we have the famous, famous Ethereum. We have the altcoins. This refers to any cryptocurrency other than the Bitcoin. Examples include the Ripple. Litecoin is very, very popular. So altcoins often serve specific uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, platforms where users can buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrencies. Example include the Coinbase, like Binance is very, very popular. Kraken. Exchanges play a crucial role in the liquidity and the price discovery of cryptocurrencies. So, of course, if you'd want to sell, you'd want to become liquid, then in this case here, you have a market, you have an exchange. Regulatory challenges, cryptocurrencies face varying degrees of regulatory scrutiny globally. Governments are grappling with how to classify and regulate these assets, considering issues such as consumer protection, money laundering, and tax evasion. Volatility, you've just said here that they are highly volatile, highly volatile. Blockchain technology, just uh, to repeat this because this is very popular in your exams, blockchain technology, decentralized and distributed ledger technology, ensures transparency, security, and the immutability of data. Applications beyond cryptocurrency, such as supply chain, healthcare, voting systems, like ladies and gentlemen, honestly speaking, I mean, at times I look at what happens, uh, especially in Africa here, yeah? I mean, it's crazy. America, in this case here, they are using Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, but tech, blockchain, to do their, to manage their voting, their election system. All right. That's why in America, you are given, for example, your voting token, even a whole week, you stay with it. You vote online. All right. And you'll never hear them complaining about what you're like, my votes have been stolen, etc. No, because of blockchain. Those blocks, the computers in this case here, networked in a way that there is nobody who can come in and uh, 
I mean, intercept and make changes. I mean, our systems here, they are very, very backward and very, very costly. All right, very backward. That we have now a database, a database that cannot even be able to know whether so and so has died, remove them from. I mean, if it's blockchain, we are connected. The systems are connected from the birth registry, death registry. Once in this case, you have hit 18 years now, you have an ID card, automatically you are onboarded onto this system. Blockchain is a very, very serious thing. So for us, we simply have a database, a database that even, I mean, I really sympathized with uh, uh, the Right Honorable uh, Prime Minister the other day. I mean, with these people on court, in court, where they were being told in this case that, uh, I mean, this is the DB, we are opening it to go and, I mean, you know, for you to be able to work on a DB very well, like myself, I'm a, a, a SQL certified uh, a practitioner. You know, I do so many things because of where, especially I used to work, software development. You know, you know, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at, uh, for example, IBC database, I mean, how do you uh, work with uh, this uh, IBC database? To be able to even discover like what happened there. So one of the things that you could use is what we call SQL. SQL. Let me just type here. SQL. So this is a structured query language. So in this case, you should be able to get to IBC database and query it. For example, ask about Oseka Mago. You'd want to know is Oseka Mago, how many times was he able to get into this uh, DB uh, D database? ETC. So at the end of the day, I mean, very complicated. Why can't our development partners in this case here help us get into blockchain? If we're in blockchain, then these leaders in this case here will be able to compete on ideas. All right. Not on, for example, will be able to steal what your votes. Why should they do bad things? And then at the end of the day, they talk of what your handshake. Look at the cost implications. All right. We shall overcome. So blockchain, ladies and gentlemen is a very, very important tool that I would want you guys to start thinking about it. It can transform our organizations here. So applications beyond cryptocurrency, uh, like you can use this in supply chain, healthcare, and voting what here, yeah, voting systems, like healthcare. You can imagine your people are suffering. You go, in this case here, to this hospital. In this case here, people get scans, for example, head scans, ETC. So, and of course, those particular hospitals, they don't even have a solution for you. So from there, you go to another hospital. You know, you keep on trying. Whenever you're sick, you keep on trying, keep on trying. So you go to this other hospital, and because they want your money, they tell you that these scans are not clear. We can't see anything. They again want you to go and do what here, take other scans. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get all these hospitals connected through what we call the blockchain. Blockchain, once in this case, I'm taking, uh, in this case here, a scan from wherever. Anybody from whichever hospital, they should be able to read my scans through this blockchain, through the blockchain. Actually, my health data is uh, automatically done what year, stored in this blockchain, and anybody in this case here should be able to access that data straight away. At times you wonder, you get somebody in this case here, for example, is diabetic. They get involved in this case here in an accident. Then they are taken, of course, as in an emergency case, say, to Kenneth Hospital, and then somebody injects them with some drug. Because this person, for example, is not able to talk, all right? Is not able to talk. Is not able to talk, all right? This person is not able to talk. Of course, uh, it's an emergency. It is. And this guy dies. If, for example, as a gentleman, we had blockchain, the doctor would have straight away, assuming that they were able to get the name, all right? They're able to get the name. The doctor should be able to get into this blockchain and get to see that uh, this person is what here. This person is having this condition and this condition. So what of uh, patient privacy? You know, doctors now, doctors, of course, it will, it will be everybody. But doctors, in this case, will have a right to get to this blockchain and uh, see a few things. And again, remember, even when, when we were saying that this blockchain is very, very transparent, there are secrecy levels. You can go there and say that I don't want this and this and this to see me. That's like this Facebook. They're operating on blockchain technology. On Facebook today, you can go and sign up and say, I don't want anybody to see my information and you remain as private as possible. So you'll be able to choose yourself. Then we go to crowdfunding. Fundraising by obtaining small amounts of money from a large number of people. 
The platforms, for example, we have Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Indiegogo is reward-based. So under Indiegogo, if you give me money through Indiegogo, when I succeed in my business, I will be able to reward you. GoFundMe is very popular because it is what here, it is donation based. Under GoFundMe, when you give me money, when you give me money, ladies and gentlemen, you will never come to demand for your money back or demand for anything from me. You donated. Like most of these churches, they're using GoFundMe. Then we have Seed Invest, we have CrowdCube. These are equity based, they're the, the shark tanks, the shark tanks. So in this case here, we go and uh, pitch our concept to them. They give us money, we give them water, we give them shares. So I would want to show you how one of these uh, works. Go fund me. So that is the GoFund, uh, your home for help. Start a GoFundMe. Start a GoFundMe. So you can see we have here for individuals, for charities, GoFundMe, how it works, sign in, etc. I would really expect you guys to be good at this. Don't look at uh, these fundraising platforms in terms of uh, just fundraising whenever people are sick. No. You simply need to know how to pitch your business ideas in these platforms and of course you're going to do what here you you're going to become a big employer i mean i know of farms is there anybody who knows of any farms here that have ever made like a billion from gofundme if you ever watch news is there anybody who knows any farms in kenya here that have made a lot of money from gofundme anybody who knows if you normally watch news <laughs> farms that have seriously made serious monies from this platform, especially GoFundMe, GoFundMe. Where in this case here, you simply go to GoFundMe platform, put up your business idea. But of course, you must be very aggressive selling, uh, sharing your ideas on Twitter, sharing your ideas on, of course, once you create here, these guys have a, a social media uh, 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 a link, which will be able to share across, right? And then you'll be able to raise serious monies globally, especially if you have got something that um, will uh, be helping in alleviating poverty, female uh, genital mutilation, CFGMs. We have here, for example, going green, going green. So please, ladies and gentlemen, I would want my students to be very, very aggressive. I know you guys are employed, most of you, of course, and you're very comfortable at your workplaces, but please, the future is here. The future is here. And remember, once you go to the GoFundMe to raise money, apart from the money that you will get, I mean, you will make your ma a product to be very popular globally, very popular globally. But for you to be able to get any money from these people, you must be very good in terms of photography, videography, even how you write. You must write in a very convincing way, in a very convincing way. Is there anybody who has a business idea that they would really want uh, it to be funded. Is there anybody who has a very good business idea that would need funding? Don't tell me that you guys don't dream. You don't have great dreams. <laughs> I would want to see whether there is anybody who can do this. I can also help them to craft something. I mean, it doesn't matter if you try and you fail. There are experiences to be learned there. You can reflect back and see where you went wrong and then you're perfect. And then, ladies and gentlemen, of course, you'll be able to see so many guys who are already doing uh, uh, who are already doing this. So let's begin your fundraising journey. We are here to guide you every step of the way. Where will the funds go? Choose the location, ETC, what best describes why you are fundraising. These are very good thing. So after you've done that, continue, ETC, ETC. So this one here will be, of course, you must create an account. You must create an account. Then we have, of course, in Kenya, a very popular 
emchanga, emchanga. All right. So platforms, we have the famous Kickstarter, India Gogo Reward Best, GoFundMe Donation Best, Seed Invest, Crowdcube Equity Best. It allows entrepreneurs to access capital and validate market demand. Of course, your concept will be very validated. It will be made valid. Once in this case, anybody sees that this person has got a lot of money online, automatically will be able to say, people will know that this is a company of high reputation, a company of high Reputation, I can see charts here. Ornamental poultry in large scale this is very good. I just dream to be rich. You will be rich, but you have to do something. You have to learn these things here. Like ornamental poultry is very, very good. Edward, do you have any poultry at the moment you're selling? Ornamental. I would want to promote you. I would want to promote you. I want to know the type of uh, ornamental poultry you are selling so that Mwalimu can promote you. And then as, as I get, I, I get a response from this gentleman, Islamic finance, Islamic finance. Now, Islamic finance operates in accordance with Sharia, the Islamic legal framework. It prohibits certain financial activities such as the interest, riba, uncertainty, that is garar and investments in businesses that involve activities considered haram, forbidden, such as gambling and alcohol. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen. Listen, the things that in this case here that are uh, Islamic, through the Holy Book, Quran, does not want. Islamic finance, of course, Islamic finance, number one, hates riba. Riba is interest. You can't sell money. But you're giving me a thousand pop. And then I return this 1,000 bob to you at the end of the month, uh, being 1,200. You know, there is no product you've sold to me. You've sold to me, in this case, your money. So in this case, your trading in terms of money, money like this, Islamic finance does not want that. Riba. Wrong. Number two, we have Garar. Garar is about speculations. All right. Islam does not want, in this case here, people to gamble. If you get any member of Islam, in this case here, getting into these betting sites, then know that this is not a genuine Muslim, not a genuine Muslim. And then, of course, we have the forbidden. Those are haram, haram products. For example, ladies and gentlemen, in accordance to Islam, alcohol. Any prostitution, if you get, in this case here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a member of Muslim, member of Islam, at Yakonampango Yakando, we will see a genuine Islam. Islam in this case here does not allow prostitution. That's why they normally give, uh, if it's a man, you're allowed to marry a maximum of four, a maximum of four, and make them in this case here officially known. Officially known, officially known. But of course, they are uh, what here they are. Very, very many rules. But what I like about Islam most, ladies and gentlemen, is the aspect that uh, Islam does not allow. You know, when, for example, you want to, like now, what happens here in this other side of the world where we have so many Christians, we have the rich becoming richer and richer because basically they are selling money to us. They're giving us loans and we're giving them a lot of interest. Like in this particular room, you will get somebody who has got very many debts. Which kind of debts? Yeah, these bad debts. For example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to adjust a bit. It's a bit too easy. That's how I'm sure. I'm gonna engage them. Nahi, them nahi. No, no. So at the end of the day, you are working for people. You are a slave. So Islam does not want this financial slavery. Does not want this financial slavery. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this case here, what do we have here? So the type of financing, Islamic financing models, for example, we have the famous Murabaha, Murabaha, Murabaha Moja, Murabaha, Murabaha Moja, where you are assisted to buy goods. You do not have money, so you're given goods. In this case, you're told, hey, go and sell. When you sell these goods, you give us back cost plus, plus a profit. So now Murabaha, 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 Murabaha
Brabaha is a cost plus financing arrangement. Instead of lending money with interest, a financial institution purchases an item and sells it to the client at a markup, which can be paid now in installments. This happens in Islamic uh, banks. Whenever in this case here, for example, is a gentleman, somebody in this case here wants like say a house. The bank can buy this house for you. And then of course they buy it at a million, all right? And then they sell it to you at what year at the other markup, not interest, but a markup, reasonable markup process. The client identified identifies a desired asset and the financial institution purchases it on behalf of the client. The client then repays the cost plus an agreed upon profit margin over a specified period. Agreed upon profit margin. Very, very important. From there, we have Musharaka, Kushirikiana. In Majina Kiswahili, Arabic. Arabic is the same as Kiswahili. So Musharaka, Mnashirikiana. So under Musharaka, you will come together, two of you. It could be more people. Two people, A and B. So once in this case here, A and B come together, they contribute monies. So A gives, for example, 2 million. B would give 2 million, even smaller or even more. Right? They contribute. And then under Musharaka, they also participate in running of this business together. So under Musharaka, Musharaka, we contribute capital and we run the business together. We run the business together. They run the business together. Maurice Rasema, nowadays I could feel that, but I'm not aware of that. <laughs> oh, wow. Great, great. So Edward, we should be able to pick this uh, talk. We a few of them for my farm at Isinya. All right. So under Musharaka, Musharaka, Musharaka is a form of partnership where two or more parties collaborate to finance a business venture. Profits and losses are shared based on the agreed upon ratio process. All partners contribute capital and the responsibilities and profit sharing ratios are determined in a mutually agreed contract. Musharaka encourages shared risk and encourages active participation in business activities. Then we have Ijara. Ijara, ladies and gentlemen, is a form of what year? Lease financing. It's an Islamic lease financing model concept. Ijara is an Islamic lease arrangement where the financial institution purchases an asset and leases it to the client for an agreed period. At the end of the lease term, ownership can be transferred to the lessee or a third party. Process, the financial institution acquires the asset and leases it to the client who pays periodic lease payments. At the end of the lease, the asset may be sold to the client at a nominal price or the lease may be extended. Then we have in this case here Sukuk. In these notes, we don't have Muduraba. This guy gave me. Okay. So Sukuk. Sukuk are Islamic bonds that represent ownership in a tangible asset. So whenever these guys give us money on Islamic Sukuk bonds, we must have tangible assets or business project here. Investors receive a share of the profits generated by the underlying asset process. The issue of Suku sales certificates to investors and the funds raised are used to finance specific projects or assets. The investors receive periodic returns based on the profits generated by the underlying what year assets. Takaful, of course, is Islamic insurance. Takaful is an Islamic form of insurance based on mutual cooperation and shared responsibility. Participants contribute to a pool, and in the event of a loss, the funds are used to compensate the affected party. Process. Participants pay contributions into a Takaful fund, and the claims are paid from this pool. The principles of mutual assistance and the shared responsibility align with Islamic ethical values. Ladies and gentlemen, we have traditional insurance and we have what we call takaful insurance. 
takaful insurance, there is no theft. Most of this Islam, let me tell you, have traveled quite a lot. Apart from, of course, this uh, concept of Al-Shabaab and a few issues here and there, which is, uh, of course, uh, extreme, extreme. Most of these members of Islam, um, sorry to say, rather unfortunate on this other side, most of these Islam members may go to heaven. May go to heaven. It will be very, very hard, ladies and gentlemen, for you to get a member of Islam seated in a particular hotel, all right? In this case here, those ones who are saved, as Lucian told us, planning on how they are going to steal from the insurance companies. Do you know, like in Kenya here, most of these insurance companies do not post profits. If you look at, for example, premium, from the premium we pay, the insurance component, if they make profits, it's out of their investments. Why is that the case? It's because, I mean, I sympathize with anybody who is running it. And that is why most of them turn out also to be uh, corrupt. Because, I mean, there are so many guys who are telling you that, hey, you know what, this vehicle of yours, like now mine is becoming a bit old, that I can just go with it and do abracadabra. It gets written off. And then we do what here? Yeah, we, we, we give you a new, I mean, that's the language outside here. So sad. So under Islamic principles, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, it's about assistance. It's about mutual agreement. If it's a takaful, and it's very, very popular initially, you'll get in this case here people saying because of a, a disease and whatever, let's have, they don't even have, at times they don't even have to go it officially, no. They simply say you contribute a million, another one a million, we put this money here. Whenever we have a problem, then we shall be able to draw monies from this fund. Like a full fund. There is a gentleman, what my gentleman left here is a, a very important concept called Mu Du Raba. Mu Du Raba. I think you'll be able to do more research, Mu Du Raba, or Mu Raba, one and the same, from the Kikui word Mondo. So under Mu Du Raba, what happens? We have the big man. The big man. So big man is a rich man. So this rich man comes and, uh, for example, partners with somebody who does not have a capital. Let's call this person B. They do business together. A's role is to contribute. Mudraba's role is to contribute, is to contribute capital. And then we have, in this case here, B's role is to run the business. If they make profits, they share as per agreed proportions. If they make losses, if they make losses, ladies and gentlemen, if they make losses, it is only the rich man who can absorb a loss. Poor people in Islam, poor people in Islam, they don't absorb losses. Because Islam is the truthful religion of bitter, bottom-up economic transformation agenda. Yeah, they're able to lift themselves very fast. Of course, I know there are also some members of Islam, of course, will not go to heaven. There are also bad ones. But I can tell you, when I look at uh, the general balance, most of those guys are very good. Even myself at a personal level, and I've practiced this, I'm sorry to say this. If, for example, I've got two people here. Christians at times, Machoma. We have two people here. We have, in this case here, Abdi. Abdi comes and tells me, Mualimu, I don't have money this semester. I'm not even working. I lost my job like that. So please allow me to study. And I'll give you this money. Those guys, I don't know what they do. I'll give you your fees in December 2024. But surprisingly, in that month of December 2024, they promised. This guy is working on white cans. What I mean? I'm white cans. Is there anybody who has got good uh, good experience with these people in terms of uh, credit? In terms of credit. But these guys are very honest. Generally, generally, please be very honest here. Be very honest here. <laughs> be very honest here. I always say that most of them have one good friend of mine, most of them, 
most of them will always honor their promises. You know, in Christianity, and this is very, very bad, it's something you need to really to change, we need to work on. In Christianity, about 80% of Christians borrow money with an intention of not paying. With an intention of not paying. They borrow money knowing for sure, I'm just walking out of this bank and I will not pay this money. I'm borrowing from, yes, I was looking for this name. I'm following, borrowing from Tala, but I will not pay. I will not pay Tala. Paka Tala, or as I a message of Christianity. For so God loved the world. <laughs> and that's why our systems are not working. All right? <laughs> are we in agreement, ladies and gentlemen? Maybe not. No, no. Are we in agreement? Are we in agreement to call Christians up to Korashida? Come on. <laughs> no. So, Maribu, so, to go rise and have a very good system, Master Lafayette, or the more to one with the intention of not repaying. We are very serious members of this class here, very serious members of this class. So you get our systems are not working because of that. Yeah, they borrow with an intention of not paying. Like Zenka, right? <laughs> so so that, that's bad. But if you go to, for example, some of these uh, states, Nemenda, come to Somaliland. Somaliland. Somaliland is part of Somalia. But the good part, if you go over there, ladies and gentlemen, even if you are working with, with dollars, even, uh, for example, in a very, very uh, way that everybody will be able to see that you have got dollars, I mean, nobody can ever snatch from you. Uko credit system works. Ukienda kwa mamboga, mamboga na kubali ata dollars na mna hii, umuambia ni patia hii, unahenda. Credit system works. Credit system does not work in Africa very well. Eh? Uh -huh. <laughs> from first day. <laughs> you can <laughs> very ninja atari way. I'm supposed to pay for you this, Frederick. I'm supposed to pay for you this. It's important you get to pay so that this money. Leave alone that. Look at, for example, some of us, like I have some fellows we work with at RCM. Anakuja, akija kunele form ya ku muambia adekle kama alikuwa 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 alipata this loan your help. The man who can me help start kulipa. Help start. And you see it's mandatory. Ata kama nilifu moja moja ma bili bili. It's mandatory. And who can me help start kulipa. Start kulipa help. So you wonder. You are very much aware of how this help assisted you. And you know that the moment you repay back, this man is going to help some other person outside there. Why are we refusing? to pay? Why are we not very good in honoring our obligations? Is it because of our black skin? You know, in the Bible, I read somewhere that uh, there is a, a man in the Bible who was cast with all his generations here. At times, I tend to think that that man must have been a black man. Must have been a black man. We have problems. <laughs> we shall overcome. We shall overcome. We need to change. We need to change. We need to change. <laughs> <laughs> we need to change. We need to change. We need to change. We need to change. So please don't forget about Muduraba. Don't forget about Muduraba. And the Muduraba, you'll be able to look for more information about Muduraba. We'll also be able to share with you Muduraba. We have A, who is a rich man. We have B, who is a poor man. A contributes money. B contributes his time to run the business. When they get profits, they share the profits. It's going to be equally or in terms of agreed uh, proportions. And then at the end of the day, if they make losses, it's only A, the rich man, who will be able to absorb. From there, ladies and gentlemen, we have this behavioral finance. We have got what we call traditional finance. No, no, no. There is something I'm not doing. It's very important for us to reflect. Like from what we have been studying, ladies and gentlemen, since we started for the last one hour, what is your take out? If, for example, this class was to end here and now, what will you say you've learned very fast as a way of reflecting back? As a way of reflecting back before I continue? As a way of reflecting back before I continue?
from the very beginning. Somebody very fast. Please be very fast in typing. And don't just type one concept. Let's reflect as much as possible. What have we learned? And without looking at the handout, what have we learned? Yeah, blockchain technology, blockchain technology. I've learned the blockchain. The blocks which are interconnected. Crowdfunding. Wow, blockchain, yes. Crowdfunding favored Islamic finance, Islamic finance, Garar problem, Riba problem. We have a Haram products, Akunyu Pombe, our Islam, crowdfunding platforms, e.g., GoFundMe, Mutinda says Musharaka, cryptocurrency, Islamic finance, Muduraba, Sukuk Islamic loans are ah, great, Takaful, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cook. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, then, if you allow me, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be able to take you through what we call behavioral finance. Here, in terms of this classification, we have what we call traditional finance and we have behavioral finance. Traditional finance is quantitative in nature. Traditional finance is quantitative. You rely on profits, quantitative. Quantitative in nature, that's traditional. And then behavioral is behavioral, behavioral finance is qualitative. Is qualitative. Is qualitative. That's behavioral finance. So remember, under traditional finance, we have investors who are very, very rational. Rational. They think before they invest. Yeah, Kenya being listed, I'll be able to explain. Thank you for asking that. It's all an emerging issue. I'll be able to explain that as we finish. Now, so ladies and gentlemen, in this case here, we have what here, behavioral finance, or rather traditional finance is that finance where investors are very rational. They think before they invest. What do you mean, Molly? So if, for example, you've got two alternatives, we have two alternatives. If, for example, today you have 40 million, and then, of course, these 40 million have got two options. In this case, you invest in uh, good apartments in Nairobi, or you invest in bonds. So then, ladies and gentlemen, what I will do if it's traditional finance, because of rationality, I must do my computations. So with 40 million, infrastructure bonds, I'll get 20%. 20% per annum is 8 million Kenya shillings every year. I can't get that money from rental property. If you give me 40 million today, I'll put all this money in infrastructure bond without, of course, that bond which does not have any tax. Now, if I'm getting now the 8 million every year to compound my wealth, what I'll do this 8 million if I love apartments, then I can start. I buy year one, I buy, I buy, I buy land. When they give me this 8 million. Year two, I mean, I'm starting in this case here, my thing. So I can easily construct a big portfolio out of this infrastructure bond. And I've taken my time always to teach my students. But unfortunately, even when I teach them, like last month, we had, uh, actually this month, we had an infrastructure bond. And I was surprised that nobody, not even a single person, bought the bonds. Not even a single person bought the bonds. Hakim Liliambia, at Yamuna Kakitu. So in this case here, if it's traditional finance, we are going to do computations. Ah, Rosemary, great, great, great. So in this case, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to do computations here. But you see, if it is tradition or rather behavioral finance behavior from the word behavior, under behavioral finance, we do not think through our decisions. We simply, in this case here, out of our thoughts. It's more to do with psychology, right? Our levels of satisfaction. You simply go to a supermarket, you're not even thought of, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, buying a perfume, then you're passing around that aroma. You buy impulse, impulse, right? So people in this case here tell you that, you know what? We have this quails business, quails business, very, very good. You simply, you are a shepherd then, just like a sheep, all right? You follow others without thinking. People, people have told you that we have got Shakahola. You follow without thinking. 
So when you make, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, business decisions without thinking or without looking at returns as your primary criteria for making decisions, then we talk of what year you having followed, what we call behavioral finance. Like the speculations, yes. But remember, even some speculators at times, in this case, they do what year they do mathematics. You know, you know, they're like, uh, I love cows. My wife does not love cows. So I keep cows in Nairobi, whatever I am. Because, I mean, she's right. This thing does not make any profit at all. No, no profits at all. All right. They're only consuming because, you know, you have to do zero grazing. When you call a veterinary at home here, it's very, very costly. So I know even myself. All right. It's not a rational thing to do. But you see, as I'm there, I mean, Nikitoka Zasa Kamazi has we are paying in an hour, Kuna, Ata Sauti, and Ombe. It's just satisfying. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, the gentleman, let me get back to this. Behavioral finance is a branch of finance that explores how psychological factors and human behavior influence financial decision making and market outcomes. It seeks to understand why and how individuals and groups make financial choices that deviate from traditional economic theories, which often assume that investors are rational. The key differences here, we have assumptions about investor behavior. Traditional finance assumes that investors are rational. Behavioral finance, however, recognizes that investors often exhibit cognitive biases, emotions, and heuristics, the mental shortcuts. I would want to be rich like tomorrow that can lead to irrational behavior and deviations from what here? Yeah, rationality. Cognitive means brain. You, you're simply biased. You're simply biased. So because in this case, you come from certain regions, you believe that this is uh, the kind of business that uh, I mean, I have to do. I have to do. Cognitive biases here. Emotional emotions, heuristics here, mental shortcuts, all right? Market efficiency, those are things you'll be able to read on your own. Behavioral finance challenges the notion of market efficiency. No, no, no. That will not be able to help me because when I, whenever they ask you about behavioral finance, it's normally quite a simple question of two, three marks. But there is something that I would want you to read here. Hard behavior. Hard Behavior it refers to the tendency of individuals to follow the actions or decisions of a larger group, often without critical analysis or independent thinking. In a herd, people mimic the behavior of others due to social influence, leading to convergence of actions, even if those actions may not be rational or based on individual information. This phenomenon can occur in various contexts, including financial markets, where investors may imitate the actions of others, contributing to market bubbles or crashes. Hard behavior is driven by a desire to conform, avoid uncertainty, or gain a sense of security by aligning with the crowd. This is a form of what, yeah, somebody? A form of behavioral finance. We are, we are influencing you to invest by basically working on behavior, your psychology, your psychology. So like right now, there are so many people you hear that, uh, I mean, they're rushing in this case to buy some dead end piece of plot somewhere. All right. What we call dead capital. You know, you know, that still is behavioral finance. You go home like this is a big mistake that I did. You go home and then you do a very big uh, house at home. Although for me, I, got, I became quite lucky, became quite lucky. I was able to convert it to, as well, the upper houses, rental property. All right. So you, you simply go home and build a very big house, for example, 12 million house. I mean, like Mwalimu here, I come from Kisi. Right now, this is, I think, my third year. I've never stepped home. I mean, why do I need a very big house? Simply because those days I was young. You know, you would want like to make a statement, to make a statement. And those days I wanted to join politics. So I wanted to make a statement, right? All oh, that is behavioral, but that you need a house back home. Of course you do, but must it be very big? Those are irrational decisions. 
the rational decisions. Those are what, in this case, we call what your behavioral finance. Behavioral finance. You simply get into them, not for profits, either as a show of psychological satisfaction or this hard psychology. You are following others. You are following others. You're not a man of your own. You're not a man of your own. You're not a man of your own. But the most important thing, ladies and gentlemen, in most cases, behavioral is more qualitative. Is more qualitative. Is more qualitative. Traditional is quantitative. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please listen. Please listen. Let me give you a very practical example here. Assuming we have a lady here called Aggie. Aggie wants to get married. Then there are two, in this case here, proposers. We have A and B. So A, in this case here, has asset base of 100 million. Rich man, Rabul Mal, rich man. And then B has, say, 20 million in assets, but he has some other attribute. He saved. He saved. B is saved. What do you think in this, who do you think will uh, Aggie go for? A, rich man, but not saved. B, has something, of course, I don't want my daughters to go to also somebody who, does, who has nothing. If you're my daughter, never go to somebody who has got nothing, nothing totally. No, no, no. No, no, no. So he has something, but he has a very important attribute here. He has a very important attribute here. This guy said, please help, uh, help Aggie make a decision here. Who do you think in this case I should Aggie go for? So now you can see most of you are saying A, A, A. And you're not wrong. It's because you guys are traditional. You are, you, you are thinking in the traditional way. In the traditional way. Where it's all about profit maximization. It doesn't matter what happens to you. You'd rather in this case here be crying inside what here? A Mercedes Benz. That's a traditional. But you see, in this case here, under behavioral finance, they tell you, hey, money is never everything. There are other aspects. There are other aspects in this case you must look at. In this case here, like, for example, this guy who is saved, this guy who is saved, like, if it's my daughter, I would have told my daughter to go, to go for B. I would have told my daughter to go for B. The money, the money. <laughs> oh, ladies will go for A. <laughs> ladies will go for A. At least Becky Lizzy. They're like a bandwagon where people in this case are simply being bundled together and then they move together. That's what we call hard, hard psychology, hard psychology. People are not looking at the profits they're going to get. Or if they're looking at that profit, they haven't sat down to calculate it themselves. It's because they've had others saying that this thing is very profitable. This thing is very profitable. That is why most of us went ahead to keep quails. And then at the end of the day, we ended up eating the eggs and all the quails and others in this case had disappeared. disappeared. That's what we call behavioral. <laughs> we shall overcome. We shall overcome. So investor sentiments, very, very important also in terms of behavioral finance, refers to the collective emotional outlook and the attitude of investors toward financial markets, assets, or the economy. It's driven by emotions such as fear, greed, optimism, and pessimism. So the, the, the sentiments, the, where you make investments with emotions, with emotions and not looking at what here, the profits are basically. So that's something I would expect you guys to go and read on your own. Very, very nice. Then we go to six, derivative markets in developing countries. Now, as a gentleman, what's a derivative? What's a derivative? And I've been able to teach you this in advanced financial reporting. A derivative is a hedging tool. It is that blanket that we want to use to cover ourselves against what here? Risks. So like right now, our great nation has borrowed huge, big euro bond. And you see the problem is that uh, most of us Kenyans, we are gullible. Somebody will come and tell you that, you know what, I've saved, I'm a savior. That Kenya was almost uh, being, uh, of course, whatever, whatever. And I have gone ahead to borrow this, which is okay, which is okay. But at the end of the day, they're not mentioning the cost. You can imagine borrowing dollars at 11%. Borrowing dollars at 11%. I mean, this is a huge task. Even borrowing locally here, you're borrowing locally here at 18%. It's very long. 
wrong. All right. So in this case here, then we would need a situation where we are able to hedge them. We have made a mistake, but how do we cover ourselves? So most countries are buying these derivatives here. All right. Derivatives. They derive their value from the underlying item, from the underlying item. So most countries are buying these derivatives here to protect themselves against, for example, increasing interest rates. Like now they should be able to transfer the risk. If the interest rate rises beyond this level, some big insurance company should be able to take that risk. So you transfer your risks using these uh, special financial instruments. We call them derivatives, derivatives. So derivatives, financial instruments whose value depends on the underlying asset. Developing countries increasingly participating in the derivatives market for risk management. Challenges include lack of infrastructure, regulatory frameworks, and investor what year, and investor education. So derivatives, they are there. Like Kenya Airways bought, Kenya Airways bought a fuel derivative, right? There are many businesses here that are buying what year, these derivatives here to manage what year, to manage risks. So they are good because they help us to manage risks. They help us to manage risks. Goes the condo. Goes the <laughs> all right. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of derivatives, what are you supposed to know? You're supposed to know that derivatives are basically hedging tools, risk management tools. We use them to manage risks. And I'll be able to cover this in detail because uh, in our subsequent topic called what year derivatives. We have a whole topic talking about derivatives. So in Kenya, of course, I've never heard of our leadership talking about derivatives people are not even looking at for example like the oil prices all right right now they are going down globally but if i were in treasury today i would be thinking about like derivatives how do we transfer the risk let's transfer this risk to countries in the middle east yeah yeah like in kenya here we don't even have a commodities uh, uh, exchange market like ethiopia they have which in this case here cushions farmers, which helps farmers here to, to transfer their risks. All right. So derivatives is a key, key, key thing. You know, in Africa, ladies and gentlemen, we have many, many issues. We have many, many issues. And that is why myself, I normally say I don't want to do any business with the government. And I'll not join the government. I made a deliberate decision. Why? Because at the end of the day, especially leadership on Rabonik, we have this MCA guy. I know he's in BDA. He was in AFM last semester. At times, we tend to really cheat and, I mean, earn without working when we are in some of these leadership positions. All right. Like right now, honestly, somebody told me to talk about this concept of what year gray listing. Gray listing. All right. Now, remember, we have what we call money laundering, money laundering. To launder, you know, launder means what here? Washing, making clean. So under, 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 under money laundering, somebody will be able to go and get illegitimate cash. Cash in this case that have been obtained from dubious sources. For example, you have arrested somebody at the sea. In this case, you have gotten ransom money. You've gotten lots of dollars. But you see now, getting this money into the financial system is not very easy. And you can't keep on working with, say, a million US dollars. And then you keep on spending. No, no, you would want this money to enter the financial system. Then how do you make this money enter the financial system? When you are making this money enter the financial of course, you need to remove the debt, the blood, many things for you to be able to get this money being clean. And uh, in this case, you're taken to the system. So like in Kenya here, Kenya, I can tell you most leaders, not the current one, I mean, like all of them, they are involved in this wash wash business a lot. Not leaders alone, many people. There are people that I know every other day they are just in these hotels, stealing money from insurance, doing whatever. So like right now, given now the gray listing, remember we have the black listing. We haven't yet uh, been given the black card. Black card is the worst, right? Now with the, the gray listing, 
Of course, that means what here that uh, most of these countries here will fear doing business with us. All right. Even in terms of visas, of automatically when you are in the gray list, especially blacklist, blacklist is the worst. People will say we don't want people from Kenya to come here because now everybody is like what here is a wash wash person. So basically, we are seeing like we are we are seen to be like a, a country of conmen. That is the implication. Is the implication. There are countries that are very countries which are on the white list, which are very strict, like the US. I'm telling you, like from today, these are a risky thing. There are companies that I know now will start looking at. Uh, I mean, even the supply. We are doing supplies for some countries there because of the great listing. This can really, really affect us. Can really, really affect us. But uh, it can only get better. If in this case here, our leadership starts in this case here, preaching the concept of what here, ethics. This concept of ethics, all right? People trying to be very hardworking at their workplaces. We work very hard, all right? We create wealth and create, of course, jobs for these young people. Because we don't create jobs for the young people, they'll get into this wash-wash business. I hope that helps somehow. The guy wanted me to talk about uh, gray listing. Yeah, like the coffee derivatives, yes. Thanks, Gera. Coffee derivative in uh, 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 Ethiopia. In Ethiopia. Now, big data finance. Now, have you guys ever heard of big data? Of course, for your master's and uh, postgraduate uh, studies, I would want you guys to do data analytics. I want you guys to be very serious people outside here. So you talk of big data. Big data, of course, we are looking at companies like uh, Coca-Cola. Like Coca-Cola. How much of data do you think do they collect on a daily basis from their social media platforms, all of them? From in this case, here they are consumers. These guys are getting data, getting to their systems very fast. It's coming structured as well as what you earn, structured data. The question is, how do we make use of this data to change it to information, which now we can use to support our, deci our decisions? We call that big data. Your syllabus wants us to talk about big data especially for banks, big data finance. Big data finance refers to the application of big data analytics techniques to large and complex financial data sets. It involves the collection, processing. It involves the collection, processing, and analysis of vast amounts of financial data, amounts of financial data to extract valuable insights, patterns, and trends. This field leverages advanced technologies and analytical tools to make data-driven decisions in financial industry. In financial industry, ladies and gentlemen, remember, data is king. A company that makes use of uh, data very well will be able to get into what we call the blue ocean. Blue ocean. Remember, we've got two types of oceans. We have the red ocean. Red ocean is uh, characterized by a lot of sharks, a lot of competition where competitors are killing each other, where competitors will smile that this particular company has fallen down, now I'm happy, no. We should strive to get into what we call the blue oceans, deep at the ocean. Deep at the ocean there, we don't fear any competition. We are in a world of our own because we've been able to diversify a lot. And that is why if you make use of big data very well, then you'll be able to propel yourself. You'll be able to get wind behind your sails, taking you straight away to what we call the blue ocean. So data is king. Data is king. And that is why serious companies, ladies and gentlemen, they always have serious feedback platforms, including whistleblowing platforms. Data is king. So how banks use big data for risk management? Banks use big data analytics to assess and manage risks more effectively. By analyzing large data sets, they can identify potential risks in real time, monitor market conditions, etc. risk management. Fraud detection, these guys will be able to detect fraud. 
simply by looking at what your patterns, simply by looking at patterns. Customer insights and personalization. Banks analyze customer data to gain insights into behavior, preferences, and needs. Now, as a gentleman, remember initially, most of us, for example, in some of these banks, we used to go inside banking halls, see how big a queue is, and then, of course, you weren't joining the queue. Once I see the queue is very big, what I used to do is to revolve around. You move around and get back. So in this case here, banks can use this big data from all their branches. I mean, how many customers bulked? We call that one here bulking, where you see the, how big the queue is and then you move away. You don't want to get that service immediately then. So they were able to use that data. And uh, because of that data, now they came up with special platforms. Because if you get somebody who is bulking like that, that person has money. What they don't want is to queue. So in this case here, they came up with special counters where they go, as you're inside there, you can even get what here, coffee, sweet, it is. But at the end of the day, as the guys who are queuing are paying 50 bob, you will pay 1,500. Yeah, so in this case here, banks can use big data for personalizing, coming up with personal products, coming up with personal products. We've gone digital, great. <laughs> Agi, when you will become uh, a very serious uh, CFO of uh, these big, big entities, you will not really, at times in this case, avoid cash 100%. You'll still need to go to banking halls, even for advice and other things. You may need that personal kind of what your attention. Credit scoring and underwriting, yes, banks can use big data Ladies and gentlemen, to ascertain your credit scores. We have alg algorithmic trading. Of course, you guys must be aware of algorithms. You see, for example, today, if you go and search for something like Isuzu on Google, you simply type there Isuzu for Google. When you go to your social media handles like Facebook, etc., they start bringing you adverts on Isuzu, you wonder, ah, jamako na mejua na tafuta Isuzu, unashanga kwa nini? Nikienda Facebook, unaona iyo. Nikienda YouTube, unaona Isuzu. Siku na ziwana pombeleni. Uleta kushanga kwa nini wa jamao na juwanga jelo. It's because of the algorithm. Algorithm. And in this case here, banks can also make use of these algorithms because of what are the big data. They are able to know the behavior. So that when, once you go to Equity Bank and you're searching a few things there, they follow you and they tell you, I mean, we have got these other products here, KCB, iBank, all the way. It's cashless. Oh, great. Even if it's cashless, Frederick, when you reach my level, you'll be able to know that uh, you can't avoid banking 100%. You'll still need to go to the bank and you will still need that personal attention. Of course, I know you can go and sign checks and whatever, uh, but there are those... You see, for example, today, if you want to borrow something like you want to build a, a, a primary school, say at a senior, you want to say like 150 million. Do you think you can do that transaction, everything online? It would be very hard. But for now, you can't understand. You'll understand these things as they get along, as you become the things you know when you become as you age. In the realm of investment banking, Big data is used to develop sophisticated algorithms for algorithmic trading. These algorithms analyze vast amounts of market data in real time to identify trading opportunities and execute trades at optimum. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we can use this uh, big data for regulatory compliance. Banks deal with a myriad of regulatory requirements. Big data analytics assist in ensuring compliance by providing tools for monitoring transactions, ETC. For efficiency, you guys will be able to read this. Market research and competitive analysis, yes, to be able to get the blue ocean. Customer service engagement, ETC, and that marks the end of this great topic. So, and gentlemen, my next topic is known as uh, real estate finance. So, under real estate finance, what are we supposed to know? We are supposed to know how to value real estates through the cash flows, like how much are we getting from these apartments? 10 million, 10, like that, we discount. We get the present value. Very nice. I'll be able to show you how to value real estates. I'll be able to define great terms for you. 
which have been asked severally. Like we have what we call the lien, lien, lien like this. We have what we call the lien like this. Is there somebody who knows what the lien means? Is there somebody who knows what the lien means? What lien means? Right to own, I like that. I like that, yeah. It comes from mortgages. It comes from mortgages. You must have heard that eh? when you want to take a mortgage, what will happen is that eh? the bank is giving you the 150 million and then they charge your property. When they charge your property, it means in the title, they'll be having KCB there and Joshua Aura there in the title. All right. And then, of course, in this title, they are given there are very many caveats. Among us, those caveats is the caveat called Lien. That these guys, in this case, here, basically they possess your property. And they should you default on your obligation, the property, you have signed everything, including transfer, the property will be theirs and they can sell it. They can sell it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a pleasure hosting you this morning. I'm looking forward again, through God's grace, to host you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye, bye, bye. And of course, as usual, Go and put your 